Would you like to say anything about being in the camp barracks back in oh. Lachie, Colorado? Yeah, good. Uh, I was uh, nine years old when I went to Amachi, and, and uh, I look at this, and it looks familiar, but it was like this, but it was about this size, <laughs> and our room was about to that being, uh, the thing I remember when I first went in, I saw one, two, three, four cots, you know, sleeping with cots. And, and uh, I can't remember the floor, but there was no, the walls were open, a uh, couple of windows. Uh, oh, great big stone block, you know, with a pop belly stove on the cold stone for heating the room. And, and, and there was only one light up in the center. Yeah, you go in the room, switch the light, the center light went on. That was it. And it was so simple, you know. Uh, Nothing there. Oh, uh, Stanham and I were uh, seven years old in the first grade when uh, I uh, was in camp. And, you know, what's interesting to me in this reproduction is that since they had to meet earthquake standards and other requirements, we have a you know, a sprinkler system built in, you know, as well as it's bolted to the floor, and we got all kinds of light, because I remember, you know, the rooms were basically 20 by 25, uh, you had three things, you had a cot for each person, a, uh, a stove, and a light bulb, that's it. What you see in some of these displays are the uh, burners, the electric burners, which were technically illegal because they weren't wired to do that, and the camp administration would hate it because it would blow out the fuse when they turned it on. But those are some of the early memories. You know, the, uh, the floors took better than I remember because there were cracks uh, on the floors because the lumber would, would start to shrink, and then the knot holes would fall out. And what you would do is get tin can covers and nail them shut so you don't put the crib inside, scorpions into your clothes. And Stan, will you tell everybody what camp you were in? Oh, I was initially in Fresno Assembly Center, mm -hmm. which was a, on the fairgrounds. Stayed there a couple of months, and we went to Jerome, Arkansas, in the middle of the swampland of mm -hmm. southeastern Arkansas. And then. Uh, <laughs> Went from there to Gila, Arizona, living in the desert amongst the Colorado River Indian tribe. Mm -hmm. And then back home again. A journey about a thousand days. About three days short of a thousand days. Two years and nine months. Because I have, oh, a reproduction of a tag here. Oh, which I oh, someplace oh, lost. Uh, and, and, you know, I, it gives me my family number as 22004 that identified ourselves and our baggage. And finally, uh, a train ticket back from uh, Phoenix, Arizona to Florida. So I know exactly when I left and I know exactly when I came back home. Thank you. Thank you. I remember the, the train. It was a hole in the ground with a wooden seat and one size fit all. And I always thought I was going to fall in. Mm -hmm. And we stayed there for a couple of months until Tule Lake. And I don't remember too much about Tule Lake except we could climb hard, um, Castle Rock. And on the other side, we could hike down. It was a pig farm. Mm -hmm. But other than that, then we went to Amachi. And like Sam said, we had that pot belly. But it was built on desert land, so it was like built on sand dunes. Yeah. And so we would have to walk down down to our facility because it was un uneven. And we had red floors. We had red floors because the sand it, it wouldn't be stable otherwise. And one of the things I remember, my mother, bless her heart, when it was Thank you. night, she didn't want us... She didn't want us 
she didn't want to take us to the bathroom, so she had a chamber pot, you know, how you learn about it in your history books, historical novels. And I don't know who cleaned them because I sure didn't. <laughs> and um, yeah. I guess this is the size of the room that house eight of us during. Uh, see how my mother and dad, thank you, my uh, four sisters and myself and a brother. So we were housed in this eight of us. And my dad sort of made a partition for the bedroom. We all stayed on one side and had pot belly and a makeshift kitchen. Let's see what else I can chamber pot. Remember the chamber pot. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the cold. When the cold people came in, the cold truck came in, it really rushed because they wanted the good pieces of coal that would burn, um, you know, vividly. Whereas you get the chips and things, and it's murder. <laughs> Well, I was only one year old when we left camp. I was born after the camp, but, I mean, after the war, but um, my parents were still in camp. And uh, uh, I was born in January, and my parents, I mean, we were all released at, in February. So I was one month old. I don't remember a, a thing, but my mother has shared stories with us, and uh, one of them is how they met. Well, they kind of knew each other, and uh, they had families that were... Uh, married to each other, you know, cousins, and and uh, they had met through family, and so they got married in camp, and then um, they uh, their honeymoon was, I probably told that story many times, uh, their, their honeymoon was go to Castle Rock with a bunch of kids, and uh, with a picnic lunch, and, uh, and then they also, as Sachi explained, um, she, my father shared with his sister and her family, they had five kids, five, four or five kids. I think it maybe a test to that. And um, so when they got married, my mother and my father shared that the barracks with them, and it was separated by a, probably a blanket. And so the other side was a big family of seven or eight, and then my my father and my mother were on the other side. So. I don't know if there was much privacy, but my sister and I were conceived there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you have to understand that when I was forcibly removed with my family, I was four years old, so I don't have a heck of a lot of memory. And I had a very traumatic experience in like, the first assembly center, which actually squelched all of my memory for too many, and most of them took that. But what I learned from my family and my sisters specifically, because they were teenagers, is you know the conditions when they first came in. Uh, for a teenager, you can imagine that privacy was the biggest issue. Uh, I think the toilets and the shower were the, the thing that was most embarrassing and a challenge for them. But you know they did manage. But you know for my own experience, what I remember is that. People took care of us. As a child, you know, we didn't have much to worry about because people looked after us. But for a teenager who knew what was happening in the nice room, it was experience. So I'll be happy to share more. <laughs> but I'm stopping. But we, we really like to remember Bob that way. And because of that, Mansour has an ambulance on site. Oh. Sorry, I have started with such a, a tradition, but. He was a really wonderful kid, and I know that we've missed him. I think the second year, Boomy, bless her heart, Bob loved, uh, what was that? Banana cream pie. Banana cream pie. pie. <laughs> she gave mini tarts, and, and it was uh, just a mouthful. <laughs> but it was in remembrance of Bob, and that was the year we invited his son to come with us. And so, wow. thank you. We'll, we'll bury it a little deeper this time. <laughs> <laughs> this come is the second time we found this. Wow. What, is it? what does it say? It's his name. Oh. Bob Uyama. Oh. Wow. And for those people who came up at the end, didn't he, hadn't he just told a funny story and everyone yes. was all <laughs> laughing and then he, and then he died, oh basically. Collapsed. So... <laughs> It was tragic and traumatic for all of you, 
But you got to think from what I've heard of Bob that that was just the perfect way for him to go. His other opportunity was to die on the golf course. Oh. I, knew a man, I knew a man that was a total golfer and he died on the 18th hole at age 99. Oh. And I'm like, yeah, let's go, George. Thank you. Uh, just a few of us were going to come here, but thank you for joining us to remember Bob. Wow. Okay. This is your favorite time partner. Everything was open air. Everything was open. Well, you know, you guys wouldn't fight me looking at each other's back. I mean, there's a limit. <laughs> That's how the, the chains were during the duration. Men's latrine, the women's latrine. Did they have toilet paper? Did they have toilet paper? I don't even know. Some people say it was like uh, store order catalog paper, Sears catalog pages, and whatever else was available. I don't think they had chiffon, uh, extra soft. <laughs> double ply. Okay. Yeah, double, no double ply. So, okay, we'll head over to the reconstructed latrine. Stan, would you like to share any memories of the latrine? Well, no, this is what it was, you know, like, uh, we, there's no partition, just the ladies, they, which is a bit more than the men's side where you were at before. But, you know, some people would be so embarrassed to have to use the, the, the privacy of this, they would bring cardboard around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And some of them would put a paper bag over their head <laughs> for the sake of anonymity. But, you know, it's one of those things. Nature calls, you go. But this is the way it was. You know, open, no stalls. It was only later in camp that they built some with little partition in between, some sense of privacy. But this is part of course. You live in a congregate living, meant for soldiers. This is what you get. So, at least they had it for women and men. <laughs> the basic camps were designed for GI soldiers, men. So we lived in facilities that basically were for, for soldiers and families lived in. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this is a good reproduction, you know, uh, of, of what a latrine looked like. There is a shower room on that side, uh, you know, and women's shower is like the men's shower. All open, no cubby hole, just a shower on the wall, you turn it on, you bathe with other people you never knew. Uh, and got to know very well. <laughs> Sachi, are you here? Yes. Sachi, do you have any memories? You know, my dad, when we were in Tumi Lake, he, he built a Japanese for all. Japanese oh, bath. Oh, nice. Because he was a plumber, so he, he developed some kind of heating system. So we were kind of fortunate in that. But I know my mom used to only go at night. Only no one asked what we found at Manzanar, many of these blocks, you can't, not this one, it may or may not be in here, but you can see like a mortar line, it's about three by five, it's always in the northwest corner of the showers, and it's where they built their own photos, their own hot tubs, right? Mm -hmm. Just um, and um, it was one of those things, because this camp was built by the army with no thought, as you know, I've already mentioned to humans, but... Um, right away, the WRSA, like, these Issei don't take showers. You know, they clean themselves and then they soak in a bath. And I don't know whether the other camps got bathtubs put in, but in this camp it was supported, you know, if you wanted to build one. And a lot of latrines, men's and women's, had those, those bathtubs. So. You still didn't have privacy from everybody else, but you had your hot soak. Unit started to disintegrate because no family dinner. 
Uh, my mother, I remember, worked as a waitress in the mess hall. She got paid $15 a month. Uh, and so, you know, you know, that's one of the things I remember about it. And uh, you basically lined up. One of the things I remember about camp is that each block had a mess hall and each block had their own chef. And some chefs were better than other chefs. <laughs> and so, they, you, know, they, they, you know, so me and my friends would eat at different mess halls until we found a good chef. <laughs> <laughs> and we would line up over there, you know, you're supposed to eat in your own block, but as kids you can't tell one from the other. And so we would just go to the one that had the best chef. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 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 They have one. We got. We were able to eat together as a family, but the food was terrible. <laughs> I mean, everyone that has been in camp will know that they were eating mutton and not lamb. Yeah. You know, they were always giving us mutton. My brother used to complain about it. And like Stan said, you could go to different mess halls if you wanted. And and some of them would say, "I'm going to go eat with my friend," you know. It is gold. There was no control. The parents didn't worry about it. They said, well, I'm going to go eat with my friend in another mess up. So it was a free fall. It was kind of democratic, I guess. You could <laughs> because at least choose one, one of your mess halls if you found a good one, like Stan said. Find a good one. But if you had money, did all the mess halls have I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think that was a staple. Issue. Yeah. In honor of the pilgrimage, and in honor of our former incarcerees, the special ordered lunch today is mutton and <laughs> <laughs> Judy, you have some thoughts? Well, uh, my father was a chef in, oh. in, in one of the mess halls. I, I guess it was for, for uh, the particular area that were, they were in, was it a or whatever. And, uh, and my mom did used to talk about how my father hated mutton after camp. Yeah, because he had to cook it. And um, but my mother loves lamb. I don't know if she, she so whenever we would go out to dinner, she we would have lamb, but she never cooked it at home because my father hated it. And uh, I myself enjoy lamb as well. Thank you. Yeah. Judy used to bring her mother on the show lunch for a number of years and has a few stories to tell about her mother, too. <laughs> Christine. Well, I remember some of the same things, but because I was so young, my mother would uh, bring food back for myself and my younger brother. And so we didn't really sit in the mess hall and eat together. But I do want to echo what Stan was saying, is that dinner time, except for the county towers, <laughs> really became the, some of the breakdown of the family structure because dad was no longer in charge. Uh, the kids scattered, but my teenage sisters all went to eat with their friends. So we didn't really have family dinners anymore. So it just really uh, broke down the family structure. The authority figure had changed. So those are lasting impacts, sadly, on most of our lives. Yes. Did it change after, after camp? Yes, we, oh, I, yes, once we came back, we all ate together. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, we lived in the country, and uh, the school we went to was more of a city school. A couple of the camps did have family seating. Mm -hmm. Julie Lake, so that might be why you're remembering that, and I think Poston. Mm -hmm. And they actually had it set up like family style, where they bring in, cooks bring in, big pots oh, of stuff really? and you serve. Okay. And there was some things I've come across in the documents and, and this is what I do because I'm a nerd. I'm a historian. Every day at lunch I read through all the old stuff. <laughs> and, and and especially the stuff that the Japanese Americans were saying, their reports every day, right? 
and they talked about someone had come in from Poston and talked about this other system, and they were saying, Manzanar, wouldn't that be better? Couldn't we do that? And, and they never did. So, yeah, I've heard that from a lot of people, that this was the breakdown of their family structure. And just a simple logistics thing, right? Sam, how you doing there? How you doing? Oh, I'm awake. You're awake? <laughs> hey, good. I am too this time. <laughs> you want to say anything well, about the mess well, halls? You know, this mess hall looks similar. It looks like this. Uh, but the one thing I remember, uh, uh, we were always in boys' gang, you know, <laughs> girls' gang. And the boys would sit on one side in a gang, you know, about the same age. And the girls would sit over there, and we were kind of stupid in those days. <laughs> <laughs> when you're nine years old, you don't know. <laughs> but that's the way it was. The, the boys, girls sat over there, boys sat over there. <laughs> okay. Now you're very wise, yeah. huh, Stan? <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that, and I'd like to th thank uh, Gregory and the Tyco team for helping out on getting things organized for the bento. So if you're really nice to them, you don't get mutton. <laughs> but we do have the uh, combination uh, tickets. You want to explain the system? <laughs> Jeff Burton, our archaeologist, was going through the Manzanar Free Press papers in October 1942. The winners of the best lock garden was third place. Jeff's like, I didn't know there was one there. We knew about the one that's in the um, they excavated it. A lot of them had the island features. And most of them, like if you see there, and then you can see this little bit too, deeper area. And that was for the fish that wouldn't get so hot in the summer. Uh, you'll see this next garden and some other two. They had what they called um, koi tons. So they never got the sun, right? I took them into the theater and they were the only ones. And I introduced a film and then he said, my mom was here. I'm like, really? Do you know where she lived? He goes, no. So he gave me her name. Um, while they were in the movie, I looked and as I'm going over with them, I'm like, oh my God, your grandfather made this garden. Oh. And he didn't know anything about it. So the next, I was on the desk that day. So the next day I brought him out here and he was visibly moved. Yeah. Um, and then his wife, because I said that, like, so they were in the barrack, it's right next to the woman's retreat. And so then the, the daughter-in-law basically was walking the path that his mom would have taken like a thousand times. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how it is at Manzanar. When people walk in, you have no idea what their connections are. And uh, it's just, it's part of the power of this site, all the people who come here. So... Question. Yeah. How did they get a koi? <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you can anything here, um, except um, if it was like rationing, you know, war kind of stuff. But you could you could have things shipped here. You could go like had grocery services, right? Before they got things shipped. And I don't know exactly how the koi came. I know sometimes they caught trout, put them in. This one was organized by Harry Wayno, who worked in the mess hall right here, and he wanted to make it more pleasant for people. Um, this was finished in August of 42. You can see he's written it there, and then it's in rocks there. It's kind of hard to tell, but um, but a lot of the blocks did this also. And then some people, like Mr. Arai, with his fish pond in Block 33, he, he must have um, welcomed his neighbors on either side because all green and beautiful. His daughter shared with us photos of it back then. And that's the one, I don't know if we put water in it. This time. Several years ago, we started putting water in that one for pilgrimage. And we since then have hooked it up with actually sprinklers for the little grass and a pump. 
so we can have water in it. We used to have to take the water from the water. Race has been used to subjugate millions across our globe. It has also been used as a unifying force for political power. La Raza, the movement for black lives, have brought together Latin, Latinx Americans, African Americans. And for us, for whom the very term Asian American is still aspirational, we are unifying under the broad umbrella of AA and PI to assert our political power to fight anti-Asian hate and also anti-blackness and also in Islamophobia and also anti-immigrant sentiment. And with our community support, we at Stop AAPI Hate are advocating for ethnic studies in school, for true community safety solutions, gendered impacts on on women and on, on children. Um, it was one of the first times in Tulsa uh, that the Red Cross, for instance, um, responded to a crisis domestically. So you see our destinies and our futures are so tied and interconnected and interdependent. Uh, we have a duty to remember as a mode of political resistance. Oh. for farming it had been burned out and overused by people who had stolen it. One family who lived on Florin Road, not too far from where we were departing, had their home firebombed and they were burned out. So they faced a massive wave of anti-Asian, anti-Japanese terrorism. People don't talk about that. And those things I mentioned to you, um, the Nisei members, those and the Issei members who experience those, don't talk about those things. Those are things that we learned from individuals I knew in the community. There were a few people who were very, very fortunate. The Sukumoto family, the Nita family, Okamoto family were all growers and farmers in Florin. They had one neighbor there, his name was Bob Fletcher. Bob Fletcher agreed to take over the farms for the families during the time they were away. Bob is considered a hero in the Florin community in this area. He farmed those three farms by himself and he had to suffer from ostracism people shot up his barn almost shot him in the side of his barn for being a Jap lover but when the Sukumotos, Okamotos and Nidas returned home to Florin they found out Bob had money in the bank waiting for them he had split the profits with those families, done all that work. He had quit his job as an agricultural inspector. But Bob told us, you know, why did you do that, Bob? Bob said, I knew they weren't responsible for Pearl Harbor. 
They were just trying to make a good living for the families, take care of people, and live like any other Americans. So there were heroes like that who stood up and were forever indebted to them. So, Sukumoto's, Danita's, Okamoto's, remember that, you know, forever. When people finally did return, those who returned, tried to find housing. The uh, Florin Buddhist Church gymnasium that we left from, dozens of families lived there when they returned because they had no place else to live. People tried to find jobs. It's very difficult. Most places would not hire Japanese at that point. My father was able to find a seasonal job in the Campbell Soup Plant. He was a decorated World War II veteran who returned to the area, Sacramento. After that, he's able to get a job as a security guard in McClellan Air Force Base. People in this area are fairly lucky that they were able to get jobs because the federal government, the state government, the city and county didn't have open bands of Japanese Americans. So that's why among the Japanese American community, you'll find a huge number of federal employees, state employees, city employees, and county employees, because there wasn't an open ban on employment there. So people tried to reestablish themselves. They worked hard. They tried to raise their families. They also tried to forget they tried to forget about the indignities, being locked up, being unjustly accused. And they tried to bury those memories. For the many people who were in the army, they tried to forget about the losses of their fellow soldiers in the 442nd and the other services. We're starting to approach uh, Florin Road here now. But after about 25 years, people like Mary Tsukamoto, encouraged by Sansei members like Christine and Stan Umeda, started talking about their experiences during the wartime. And Mary Tsukamoto became a leader of the redress movement bringing up those issues to the 1970s and through the 1980s until redress was finally won in 1988. And many of the uh, Sansei members of our chapter had been active in those types of movements through the 70s and through the 1980s. You know, people like Christine and Stan, Fumi and Sam Shimada, Donna and Titus, Twyla Tamita, myself, Judy Fukuman, were all active during those times, the 1970s and 80s. And because of that history and that legacy, you know, many people in our Florin J. Cell believe that the story has to be told, that we need to respect other people's cultures, that we need to stand up and have a responsibility to advocate for social justice, not just for our own community, but for others who are being unfairly accused. So that's the kind of legacy that we have in our Florin JCL and in the community as a whole. So I encourage all of you to take the lessons you've learned, take the experiences you had, and think about, well, what can I do? You know, what kind can I do to take advantage for the opportunities that Omar talked about, that Josh talked about? What can we do to help out others and continue forward? And, you know, there's many things we can do. 
And whole, one of the things we do is the Manasnar pilgrimage, which we've been doing starting 18 years ago. So, you know, continue supporting things like this, continue getting involved, join the organizations, become involved in social justice. You know, those are the things that have great value for our country, for ourselves, our community, and our families.